Okay, let's talk about the different types of mutations that you might encounter. Now, if you recall what I talked about in class, I said that there's different ways of viewing mutations depending upon you're taking kind of the more biochemical look and concerning yourself with what happens to the DNA uh, or whether you're taking a more genetic look and your focus is more on what happens to the meaning of the gene within the context of the cell. Uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, the, the, uh, the different types of mutations from a biochemical view. All right. Uh, so the most common type of mutation is a single nucleotide substitution or a point mutation. You know what? This doesn't seem to be working. A point mutation. Uh, so you can see I've got like a little sequence of DNA right here. Uh, point mutation is called a point mutation because it happens at a point and it affects that point and it doesn't affect anything before or after that point. Um, generally speaking, you substitute one base, you've affected one point. So if I take this and go like that, boom, I replaced a G with an A, I've created a point mutation, a single nucleotide substitution at that point. Next type of mutation uh, you can do to DNA is an addition or a deletion. Much like it sounds, uh, an addition or a deletion, you start with your sequence again, and for an addition, you add a base in. For a deletion, you would <coughs> subtract a base. Sometimes additions and deletions can happen uh, for multiple bases, like you add multiple bases, you subtract multiple bases, this can happen when, like, the enzyme that's making the DNA kind of, like, skips or sputters or something like that. Um, but you're adding at least one uh, base to your DNA or taking away at least one base from your DNA. Usually it's going to affect one strand, not both strands, although it is possible to have double-stranded additions or deletions if, uh, especially if you've broken the DNA. A third possibility is a transposition. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about these, but with a transposition, what you have is a huge chunk of DNA. Uh, it's usually going to be several hundred base pairs, although I'm not going to show all that many base pairs, uh, basically get taken out of one section of the DNA and excised. So taken out of the entire strand of DNA, and then you move them someplace else, and then you drop them in there. Sometimes they land in the middle of a gene. If they do, they're likely to totally disrupt that gene. Point mutations are the most common type of mutation, uh, additions and deletions are less common. If we're looking at point mutations, uh, then there are two types, depending upon the type of bases involved. First off, there is a uh, transition, which is replacing a purine with a purine or a pyrimidine with a pyrimidine. There's two types of DNA bases. Basically, purines, sometimes abbreviated PU, are A and G. Pyrimidines, PY, are T, C, and U. Um, note that 
purines don't bind to other purines. Pyrimidines don't bind to other pyrimidines. A binds with T. G binds with C. So you always have a pyrimidine binding to a purine. Uh, chemically, the difference between these two things is that the purines are larger, double-ringed structures, whereas the pyrimidines are smaller, single-ring structures. So in this DNA strand that I've put here, I've conveniently labeled the purines as being big and the pyrimidines as being small. So in a transition mutation, you're going to replace a purine with a purine or pyrimidine with a pyrimidine. Boom. That was a G. I replaced it with an A. Right? This is definitely a mismatch. These two bases don't base pair with one another. But there's less structural interference in the strand of DNA because you still have a big base across from a small base. Um, if you try to have two big bases across from each other, they interfere, they bump into each other and kind of tend to make the strand go all bulgy. If you have two small bases across from each other, then they don't even touch at all and the strand becomes very weak there. Um, both of these are more, uh, so um, transition mutations are less damaging than the other sort, which are called transversion mutations. With a transversion mutation, you replace a purine with one of the pyrimidines or a pyrimidine with one of the purines. So in this case, we're gonna replace the G with a T. And here you see we have a small base across from a small base. This is going to be both more damaging as well as easier to detect and repair. Transitions are the most common type of point mutation. Transversions are less common. Now let's talk about the view of mutations from sort of a genetic perspective. Now remember that transition, transversion, frame shift, whatever, can all fall into any of these categories. Here we're talking about the meaning, the effect of the mutation. And there's going to be some trends, but no hard and fast rules. The first view of a mutation is what's called a silent mutation. In a silent mutation, you have uh, a mutation. It's a real mutation. It really is a change in the DNA. However, it doesn't have any effect on the gene. So, for instance, the, uh, the codon Oops. T A T codes for the amino acid tyrosine. A, a codon is a three letter word in the DNA alphabet. So in the genetic code, uh, anytime you have a gene, you're going to divide it up into three letter words, three bases. And you can't have more than three, you can't have less than three. And just like an English sentence, right, um, we have some punctuation as well. So, uh, and we have some redundancy. So TAT is a genetic word, a codon, that means the amino acid tyrosine, TAC, also means tyrosine. So if you think of, I say, the big dog or the large dog, those are different words, but they mean the same thing. So I have, if I say the big dog is over there or the large dog is over there, that pretty much means the same thing. 
that is a silent mutation. There's been a change, but that change doesn't have any effect. Next possibility is a missense mutation. I'll get rid of that. So with a missense mutation, you have changed the meaning of the gene. You have not destroyed it. It still has meaning, but its meaning has changed. It might be a big change, it might be a small change, but it's a change. So for instance, I have here a sentence. And in this sentence, you'll note that all of the words are three letters long. So that corresponds to uh, you know, the genetic code where every word is three letters long. I have the dog ate the cat. Everyone understands what that sentence means. There's a dog, there's a cat. It's a bad day for the cat, all right? Let's have a missense mutation. Boom. I replaced one letter with another letter. I didn't destroy the sentence, right? This is still a grammatically correct sentence. All of these are words, they all have meaning. The meaning has changed, right? Before, the dog ate the cat, and I know exactly what that meant. Here, the dog aged the cat. Okay, that's a little weird. I'm not sure exactly what age means in this context. The sentence doesn't work as well as the other one did, but it's still a sentence. We can still get some meaning from it, right? We know there's a dog, there's a cat. The dog is doing something to the cat. There is still meaning here. The meaning has been changed, but it has not been destroyed. In our third case, we have nonsense mutations. We have the same sentence here, the dog ate the cat. But in this case, instead of a uh, point mutation, a single base pair substitution, I'm going to put in a, uh, an addition. Remember, we have to keep our rule of three base or three letter words. So now our sentence has become the dio got f ekata. The dio got f ekata. Does that make any sense? No, that doesn't make any sense. Because adding a base in here. has changed what we call the reading frame. The reading frame is how you take a gene starting at the beginning and going to the end and divide it into three letter sequences. And each of those three letter sequences means a specific thing. If you add a base in, then you have changed how all of the words line up. And now your, uh, none of your words past that point are going to make any sense. They will all have been changed. So if you have a what's called frame shift, that's an addition or deletion mutation, then that's going to screw up every codon following the point where the mutation takes place. It's possible that this might lead to a missense mutation but very, very highly unlikely. Because just like in English, the genetic language has punctuation to it. What starts an English sentence? A capital letter. And just like that, in the genetic language, we have uh, a start codon, ATG, methionine is what it codes for. 
That is always found at the start of a genetic sentence, a gene. You also have a period that marks where the gene ends. In English, like the capital letter is a part of the sentence. The period is not a part of the sentence, but it indicates where the sentence ends. And the same is true in genetics. The start codon is a part of the gene. It codes for the amino acid methionine, and methionine is a part of the gene. The stop codon, of which there are three, is found at the end does not correspond to an amino acid and marks the termination point. However, there are still three codons that code for it. And if you have a frame shift mutation, then chances are pretty good that just randomly, somewhere within the next 20 amino acids, next 20 codons, that follow that frame shift, uh, you're gonna just randomly have created a stop codon. And you'll get what's called an early termination event. Early termination events destroy the function of the protein. These are sometimes called loss of function mutations. You have destroyed the meaning of the protein, you have destroyed the meaning of the gene, the gene no longer makes sense, just to show you, a deletion does the same thing. This doesn't make any sense anymore. Doa tet heck at. There's another way to get a nonsense mutation, which would be what if this mutation here instead of creating a different codon, a different word, had turned that into a stop codon. Now you just have the dog. That's not a sentence. No verb, no object. That's an early termination event and would usually be a nonsense mutation. So early termination events as well as frame shift mutations lead to nonsense mutations. Um, changing a codon in a way that changes the meaning of one of the codons. So for instance, TCT codes for the amino acid serine but CCT codes for the amino acid proline. So if you change that T to this C, that's going to be a missense mutation. Missense mutations might have very small effects, or it might have very large effects. It depends on where in the gene it happens. It depends on how different the two amino acids are. Um, and uh, sometimes it just depends on random stuff. Silent mutations are where you have a change in the codon. But there's no change in the gene because both the codons code for the same thing. All right, those all came in at the end. That was weird. So, <clears throat> most mutations are uh, spontaneous. And uh, spontaneous mutations can happen kind of anywhere. They can be additions, deletions, single base pair substitutions, even a few other things. However, there are things that can induce mutations, and we call these things 
mutagens. A mutagen is anything that generates a mutation or induces a mutation. Um, so there are various chemicals that can induce a mutation. There are, uh, there is certain types of radiation can induce mutations. And there are transposons or transposition, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, these are often the remnants of dead viruses that got stuck in the genome and sort of hop around a little bit. They can also induce mutations and they also kind of happen spontaneously. So they're a little bit of a tricky thing to go through. We're not going to cover them very much. First class of chemical mutagens I want you to know. Nitrous acid. All right? Nitrous acid is going to convert an amino group to a keto group. And what that does is change cytosine to uracil. C binds with G, whereas U binds with A. So if you change a cytosine to a uracil, then the next time the DNA is replicated, where you should be putting a G across from what used to be a C, you will now be putting an A across from what used to be a U. This is going to create a G to A mutation. Think for a second. What type of mutation is that? That is a transition mutation. Next category, alkylating agents. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different chemicals that are alkylating agent. Um, they alter the hydrogen bonding of bases, uh, and the hydrogen bonding of bases is what determines their specificity. Um, while alkylating agents can have a wide variety of different effects, they are typically going to produce transition mutations. Because if you're alternating, uh, altering the hydrogen bonding, you're not altering the size of the base. So you're still going to probably end up with a big base across from a small base. Next category, base analogs. These are chemicals that look like one thing sometimes and something else sometimes. They're kind of like chameleon bases. So for instance, there is 5-bromouracil. 5-bromouracil can sometimes resemble a T and sometimes resemble a C. So it ends up uh, like binding in place of thymine. It looks like a T. Let's put a, uh, let's go here. A, T, G, C. Suppose that you have a strand of DNA, you're replicating it, all right? The new strand, you look here, this is an A, you wanna put a T across from it, but you end up putting five bromouracil, because five bromouracil can look like a T. And then you keep on going. Then, during the next round of replication, 
when you're replicating across from this strand. Well, when you're replicating across from it, 5-bromouracil looks like a C. So you're building across from this thing and you put in a C here, a G there, a T here, and then you look at this 5-bromouracil and from this direction, it looks like a C. So you put a G across from it. Well, what happened? This used to be an A, and now it's a G. So what type of mutation is that? Transition. Uh, there's another base analog called 2-aminopurine or diaminopurine. No, uh, just two aminopurine, diaminopurine, something else. Uh, and it looks like an adenine when it's coming in, but then when you're putting something across from it, it will bind to cytosine. So it's going to create T to C mutations. Which is still a transition. Intercalating agents. Uh, the way intercalating agents work is basically, uh, so you get a strand of DNA. Alright, the intercalating agent squeezes in between the bases, and that sort of stretches out the DNA in each direction. So now, when you are replicating the next time, let's see if I can get this about as even as possible. where you have your intercalating agent, there's going to be an extra large gap. And when you're building across from it, you go put down that, 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 and then where you expect to be putting a new base, there's nothing there. So you can't go forward. And you're not just gonna stop so what the DNA polymerase does is it just puts a random base there and then keeps on going. And so what you have done here is create an addition mutation, a frame shift. Um, so ethidium bromide which is one of the main chemicals that we use to make DNA visible. So like if you've seen one of those, uh, um, like CSI or something like that, they're showing a, some sort of DNA pattern. What is it that makes the DNA all glowy? Well, the most common thing that's used is ethidium bromide. And ethidium bromide is thought to be an intercalating agent, though I've recently learned that there's actually not good evidence for that. It looks like it should intercalate into DNA, but we haven't actually seen evidence that it causes mutations. But mm, it's still something that we worried about a bit. Um, anything that causes mutations can cause cancer. So basically, any mutagen is potentially a carcinogen. Uh, moving from chemicals to radiation, there's two types of radiation. Radiation can be either 
ionizing. Or it can be non-ionizing. Ionizing means that the radiation, which is just an energy form similar to light, uh, ionizing radiation has enough energy that it can knock an electron away and create an ion, which means it can basically break a chemical bond. Um, if you can break chemical bonds, you can cause mutations. Because you could break a chemical bond in the DNA and knock a base out. Or you could break the backbone or something like that. So ionizing radiation is always mutagenic. Non-ionizing radiation is actually super common. Um, so, like, the light in the room that you are currently looking at this video on is non-ionizing radiation. The radio waves that control your cell phone are non-ionizing radiation. Microwaves, which are everywhere, are non-ionizing radiation. And ultraviolet light is non-ionizing radiation. For the most part, non-ionizing radiation is harmless. By definition, it can't break a chemical bond and therefore can't do anything to your DNA. There's one exception to this, UV light, right? So ultraviolet light is the highest energy form of non-ionizing radiation. Uh, so it doesn't quite have enough energy to destroy a chemical bond, but it's almost got enough. And in, uh, uh, and it happens to be that DNA absorbs a few specific wavelengths of UV light most notably UV light at around 260 nanometers. But there's a few other wavelengths as well. And if you have two thymines, thymines are actually the base that absorbs UV light. Um, the other base is, well, cytosine does a little bit. A's and T's don't really at all. Uh, so, if you have UV light that hits this thymine, it gets absorbed by it, and it doesn't break the bond, but what it does do is impart some energy to the bond, and that makes the bond less stable. All right, suppose you also have UV light that hits this adjacent thymine, and it gets very energetic as well. Under the right circumstances, these two energies combine, and what you get is the two thymines actually rearrange their bonds to bind to each other. And this is called a thymine dimer. So UV light creates thymine dimers, um, which isn't quite exactly the same thing as a mutation, but I'll tell you in just a little bit how that ends up mutating the cells. So UV light forms thymine dimers, which means in order to affect something, in order to create a mutation, you have to have a sequence that has two thymines next to each other, which is not uncommon. X-rays, X-rays and gamma rays both fall into this category. Those are two common types of ionizing radiation, and what they do is they break bonds. 
X-rays are most known for double-stranded breaks. With a double-stranded break, you've got like You got your DNA, all right? And you've got your ionizing radiation that comes in and hits it, and um, you shatter wherever it hits. So if that hits in the backbone, it breaks the DNA. If you have another double-stranded, or uh, another um, x-ray that hits in a place close by, well now, your DNA has broken apart into two pieces. And if your DNA breaks apart into two pieces, that's bad. Usually, it's just lethal. It just kills the cell. The cell will try to repair it, but there's no guarantee that it'll actually, like it doesn't know which end pairs up with which end. So it might stick these DNAs together backwards, or uh, it might stick one of them to a different piece of DNA. And if it does try to fit them back together, there's usually like some joining errors when it tries to put them back together and it'll like either eliminate or, uh, add in a couple of bases, wherever it is that it joins them together, which creates frame shift mutations, which can be very damaging. So X-rays and gamma rays cause double-stranded breaks. So that's all well and good. We've shown how mutations can happen. Why don't we all just collapse into a huge mutated mess of cancer? Well, because we can repair the damaged DNA. Uh, depending upon when and how the damage is repaired, there's a few different mechanisms for it. Uh, probably the most commonly used type of repair is proofreading. Proofreading happens while DNA replication is going on. So let's say that you have a strand of DNA that is three prime, five prime, G A T T. All right. And now you're laying down some DNA across from it. You see an A there, you put a T, C there, you put a G, A there. You put a T, T there. You're supposed to put an A? Let's suppose you put a G. Well, that is a mutation. That's a spontaneous mutation. G does not go across from T. The enzyme that's doing this has a little bit on the back called the proofreader. And as it tries to move forward to the next base, sees a T, puts an A, it scans everything that it has made and it will realize that this GT is wrong. At least we hope it will. Um, it, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And it'll go, hey, 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 wait, 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 wait. You can't go forward. You gotta back up and fix this thing. So then, your DNA polymerase will back up, pass the mistake, and do it again. hopefully getting it right this time. 
That's proofreading. It happens while you're making the DNA. Second is mismatch repair. Proofreading is not perfect, right? Uh, somewhere between one in 100 and one in 10,000 base pairs that a new uh, 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 DNA polymerase puts down will be a mistake. And the proofreader will catch the mistake somewhere between 99% and 99.99% .99 of the time. But that's not 100% of the time. And organisms get a lot of DNA. If you figure that it's 99.99% effective, that's great until you realize that there's like, you know, several tens of millions of DNA bases in a genome. We got that many bases. Even a very, very low mistake rate means that some mistakes are gonna get through. So we have mismatch repair. Mismatch repair happens after the DNA is replicated. There's a quality control system. Now first, something I wanna tell you here, right? DNA, before it's replicated, gets methylated. Which I'm going to draw as these little tags. Uh, specifically, it's the A's that get methylated, but whatever. Um, and then, when this goes to be repaired, or not repaired, when it goes to be replicated, It separates into two strands. And each one gets a new strand laid across from it. But notice something. In this original DNA, both the strands were methylated. They both have these little tags on them. In the new strands, the old half is still methylated, but the new half doesn't start off methylated. It doesn't get methylated until sometime after DNA replication has occurred. During that time, you can still figure out which the new strand was because it's the one without any methyls on it. That's important because, say, there's a mutation right up here, right? We have a mutation. An enzyme comes by and detects it. It goes, here's a G. It's a cross from a T. That's bad. That's a problem, right? Gs and Ts shouldn't be across from each other. Now the enzyme has to make a choice. Well, which one's the mutation? Should I replace the G with an A or the T with a C? How do you know which is the right one to do? And the way you know is the old strand is methylated, the new strand is not, and we assume that the new one is the mistake. So the enzyme is going to go through and cut a little bit upstream and a little bit downstream of the bad base, take out that whole section, and then lay down a new section of DNA in that hole. And hopefully it's going to do it right this time. After the new strand is methylated, you can't tell which is the mutation and which it's supposed to be. Doesn't mean you're not gonna fix it, but it means that you got a 50-50 chance of getting it right when you fix it and a 50-50 chance of cementing the mutation in place. 
So this type of DNA repair is, uh, and reminder, this is mismatch repair. Mismatch repair uh, is effective for some time after uh, the DNA replicates. But you have to methylate the strand before the next time the DNA replicates. So the faster your cells are dividing and growing, the shorter the time window for mismatch repair to take place is. Rapidly dividing cells, rapidly growing cells, are more prone to mutations because they have less time for repair. Yeah, I know, you can probably hear the cat in the background. She's not actually in distress. She's just upset that I've locked her out of the room while I'm recording. Now, I mentioned thymine dimers before. And <clears throat> thymine dimers actually aren't a mutation in and of themselves. They just stop DNA replication. If you've got a DNA strand that has a thymine dimer in it, when the DNA replicates, gets to the thymine dimer, it just doesn't know what to do. It goes, I have nothing I can do here. And it freaks out and it stops. <clears throat> if you do not repair the thymine dimer, the cell cannot replicate and will die. You have to repair every thymine dimer or the cell dies. So we got a couple of different ways to repair them. First is what's called photoreactivation or light repair. It's also sometimes called perfect repair. Now remember, this damage was done by UV light. With perfect repair, you have an enzyme that sits right where the thymine dimer is, and this enzyme then has to be activated with blue light. And when blue light hits this enzyme, the enzyme changes shapes. <clears throat> and that is going to break the thymine dimer apart back into just two thymines. And then you can continue on replicating your DNA. That's why it's called perfect repair. It totally repairs the thymine dimer. It just does what made the thymine dimer, but in reverse, and now you go back to having two thymines there. It's called light repair or photoreactivation because this light, or this enzyme here, which is called photolyase, has to be activated with blue light. So this type of repair can only happen in the light, hence light repair. Uh, my uh, roommate, back when I was in graduate school, actually worked on an interesting system involving this, where basically he would take colonies of bacteria on a plate, and he would just hit the plate with UV light, and that would kill off all the bacteria. They'd all get tons of... Uh, thymine dimers, it would overwhelm the repair systems and then they would just die. But then he would resurrect certain colonies by targeting them with a blue laser. And the ones that he hit with the blue laser would come back to life and start growing again. because the blue light from the laser would activate photolyase, which would repair the thymine dimer damage. Now, 
you don't always have light around. Sometimes you're in the dark. Sometimes it's nighttime. Sometimes maybe you get something shading you. Sometimes you might just have too much damage uh, to repair with just photolyase. So they have a second, bacteria have a second repair process called dark repair, sometimes also called excision repair. In excision repair, you have a thymine dimer, and that thymine dimer makes a kink in the DNA. Um, it actually physically kind of bends the DNA a little bit. There are enzymes that scan up and down the DNA all the time, and wherever they find a kink, they stick there. And when they find a kink, they cut sort of up and down stream quite a bit of the uh, of the thymine dimer. This is sort of like the road repair philosophy. If you ever seen, uh, you know, sometimes it's a pothole on the road, and instead of just filling the pothole, they decide, oh no, wait, 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 wait. We can't just fill in this pothole. We gotta like rip up the street for like a hundred feet up of the pothole and like a hundred feet down of the pothole and lay down a whole new street to fix that pothole. Well, that's what they do here too. Right? They just go, all right, no, 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 no. This is a thymine dimer. This is a big thing. We got to, like, cut out this whole big section of DNA. All right, you see here, it's just cutting out the whole section of DNA. And then we're going to lay down a whole new section of DNA. But here's the problem, right? The, the enzyme that repairs the strand that lays down the new DNA. Yeah, think of that road crew as being drunk. Um, the enzyme that lays down the new DNA is just not very good at its job. It doesn't have a very good proofreader. And so it tends to make errors, right? And so maybe it, uh, screws up that A and replaces it with something else, a G or a C. So that's how UV light leads to mutations. Uh, it's the, the, the thymine dimers themselves don't cause mutations. Thymine dimers just kill the cell. It's the repair process. Dark repair, excision repair is a sloppy process. It's also sometimes called imperfect repair, as opposed to light repair, which is perfect. Light repair always restores the DNA to its original sequence. Dark repair sometimes screws things up during the repair process. And that's where the mutations from UV light come from. All right, well, uh, I hope that this made a certain amount of sense. And uh, yeah, uh, please bring any questions into class.